Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. Sunday chat today is based around the answers, as best I can, to the questions that were put under the uh, Thursday video Q's and A's time again. Um, that's how we do the Q's and A's. Um, a couple of other things before I start. So before we start, um, relevant to some of you, not all, but those of you that have been around on this channel quite a long time will remember Rick L and his contribution to YouTube specifically regarding nutrients and, and the like. Um, he was an ill person and ended up having to give up his collection due to his illness. Um, those of you who are also a member on my Facebook group, and if you're not, the link is in the description of all my videos, there is a notice from Rick to somebody who's posted it on the Facebook group. So you can all have a read on how Rick is doing. Um, not too clever, but um, the information's there for those of you who want to see it. Um, that sort of thing's unlikely to get onto YouTube as a consequence, because it's a you know, as a part of an email, I suspect, um, or maybe a, a message on Facebook, I don't know, but it's been posted on the Facebook group, those of you who want to see it. Um, that's that. Right, lights. The time has come. We're now mid-December, progressing through December. Um, I ordered a timer for my lights, and blow me, it was out of stock, so I still haven't got one. So my shopping arrived without it. Um, I will, they now don't do that item. <laughs> so whoever, whoever had the last one had the last one and they're not getting any more in by the sounds of it. So I will go and get one. Um, there are several um, retailers around that will sell one of those. I'll, I'll venture out, you know, put my hat and coat on and go and get one. Um, early this week, I suspect. Um, uh, Yes, so that's that, and the plan with the lights now is as we've come to that point that I'm effectively declaring autumn now. Now I know the real autumn has been some time ago, but I've been using my lights to maintain a 12 hour day length, so I've refused to let most of my plants accept the fact that it's autumn. In other words, I'm hoping they've kept growing. It's difficult to tell. But we're now going to come into autumn, so what I'll be doing now progressively for the next probably two to three weeks is reducing the amount of the lights. So my day lengths will be getting shorter and shorter, which is hopefully going to trigger autumn to the plants that are under the lights. They can then have a bit of a rest, yeah? And then I will introduce the start of spring quite early, probably the last week in February. So for most of January and most of February, I won't be using the lights, I'll have wound them down. And so I don't need the timer, do I? Probably make do without the flipping thing, quite honestly. But um, yeah, and then we'll be introducing spring early to try and, those that aren't in growth, to try and bring them back into growth. Um, Hopefully that's going to trigger growth on most of my dendrobiums because they're the ones that have suffered the most with this um, change of environments. Right, so that's that. There's not much else going on. Um, so let's get on. Questions and answers then. I've relisted these in newest first and I'm starting at the bottom. So I'm starting with the oldest and then we will work up. The idea of doing it like that is that... Um, if any new ones come in while I'm actually doing this, they'll be at the top when I get there. That's the theory. Right, um, I will have to use the channel names because that's all I've got unless somebody's put their actual name in the text of the comment. So the first question is from the channel. It's... Um, Petri Lindstrom. It took me a while to decipher that, <laughs> where the word break was. And the, the comment ends with, thanks for thoughts and tips. Greetings, Sammy from, Swin from Finland. So that's, that's this. Question. Um, Hi, Roger. Do you think that if you use fertiliser in smallish amounts in winter time, it's detrimental for your plant's health, particularly cymbidium and nobly types of dendrobiums? Um, 
I'll say a bottom line, no, it's not detrimental. But what it could do is affect what the plant's going to do next. Yeah? Now with the nobly type dendrobiums, winter time is their time of rest. During this time, water should be reduced right down to next to nothing, feed should be eliminated, and they should have the brightest light possible and much cooler temperatures than they had during the growing season. And I always say with nobly types, fool them into believing that. <laughs> so in other words, keep them quite shady during the growing season and keep them reasonably warm. Then when you come to winter, it'll be easier to give them brighter light and cooler temperatures. Yeah, so you can sort of fool them. But um, cymbidiums come into two types. You've got the type that um, start to spike late summer into autumn or early winter. That's when they start their spikes. They come into bloom any time from now. There's one behind me, bright yellow, yeah? Any time from now right through into February is when their spikes start coming into bloom. But the spikes are initiated by the night temperatures cooling down to us during summer sort of August time, August, September time. We still think we're in the middle of summer, but the days are starting to get shorter and the nights are cooler. And that's what induces the spikes inside the bulbs. You can't see them yet. This is the embryo spike inside the bulbs. That's one type of cymbidium. The other type of cymbidium blooms midsummer. Yeah? Now, they're a different kettle of fish because their spikes are gonna start they'll be induced by the increased day lengths and warmer temperatures of early spring so that their spikes start growing then. For that to happen they need to have matured their bulbs. So their bulbs are maturing during the winter time. Getting rid of feed during such times might not be the best of ideas. Yeah, so two types of cymbidiums. When in active growth, feed. Forget the time of year. Look at the plant. Yeah. So uh, that's a bat one then. Um, right. So the next one isn't a question, so we'll bypass that. Right, the next one is Wanda Shaw. Regular comment. Regular viewer. Um, regular commenter. Do you know, I think the, um, the, the thumping noise I get almost every day now, I think the cottage, the nice thatched, co thatched cottage down the end of this garden here, they've probably got an open fire that burns logs. They're out here chopping logs, I think. Oh, I'd love to be doing that. I love an open fire, a log, you know, a log fire, not coal, logs. But, you know, for that you need a fireplace and a chimney, which I ain't got. I had once in my house a long time ago when the kids were little. Right, um, next one then from Wanda Shaw. Do you think you would ever experiment with any other type of substrate other than what you currently grow in? Well, I have done. Um, if you go back far enough on this channel, I'd have tried LECA. I've tried semi-water culture with LECA. I tried ceramis in water culture. I tried ceramis without water culture. I think the only thing I haven't really tried is the... Um, rock wall cubes because <laughs> I get a rash if I touch the flipping thing so that's not going to happen and also growing in pure charcoal. I've tried growing in um, lava rock, tried growing in pebbles, um, so I've tried most things at some point as, an, as experimentation um, and like Danny I've tried and gone round and round in circles and I've had to readjust my media for this place. So things that were quite happy in a certain media at my previous place, which was much warmer and got some sun through the glass in the winter time, that media is not so good for those plants here. That's what's caused a lot of the rot. Yeah. So um, yes, I have experimented. I, I'm experimenting now, if you think, because I've gone back to small bark perlite and chopped up New Zealand sphagnum moss. Well, I eradicated moss apart from a few mounts. Now I'm back using it. It's gone full circle. 
So yes I do, but um, I'm reasonably static at the moment for this environment and it is mainly based on bark, breaks down slowly, holds some water but not too much, not enough to start getting soggy roots. So I'm happy with that here with cooler temperatures. Right, that's that one then. Uh, what have we got now then? We've got Louise Renders. My cat Leah's making a lot of new shoots. Well, well done. <laughs> Mine aren't. <laughs> uh, all of them stand in the same place with enough light. One will bloom twice a year. The other six, they grow like mad, but not a single bloom. Any advice? They stand in a very hot place, around 32 to 36 degrees. Well, there's your problem number one. In summer and in winter, around 2 to 15 degrees. And there's your problem number two. They've had them for three years. When the temperatures get above 28, 29 degrees, many orchids shut down because they can't get enough moisture in at the roots to pass through the plant and evaporate through the pores in the leaves. That's how they grow, that's how they feed themselves, that's how they cool down when it starts getting hot. And if they can't keep that going, they will close down the pores in the leaves, which stops growth, it stops lots of things happening, photosynthesis, they just shut down because if they didn't, they would dehydrate no matter how much moisture is at the roots, they can't get it through the plant quick enough. So I would suggest you find somewhere cooler for a start. Um, I mean, Cattleyas are warmer growers in the main. There are some cooler ones, some cooler growing Lalias, but um, in the main, they're classed as warmer growers. So, you know, 26 to 28, 29 is good. That's, that, that's their happy place, really, for growing. Um, and most of them are classed as high-end intermediate into the warmer section as far as, you know, your temperatures are concerned. So down to two degrees in winter is much too cold for them. Again, they will stop growing. And if you keep stops starting a plant, it's never going to gain enough internal strength to think itself, you know, I think I'm going to have a go at blooming now. It'll always be battling to survive. So I would suggest you try and do your best to adjust your temperatures up in the winter. 15 degrees is okay. If you can keep it to that or a bit higher, that's your good, you know, nighttime temperature for winter. That's okay. Um, and then try and reduce your daytime temperature down. It sounds like you've got light sorted. They're not high humidity, but then at temperatures like 32 to 36 degrees, if you haven't got really high humidity, the plant's going to suffer. So have a go at uh, playing with your um, temperatures. I doubt if it's light. It sounds like light's okay. Right. <laughs> I love this channel name, The Cower Pinky. I'm sure that's got some meaning, <laughs> whatever a cower pinky is. Dear Roger, what is your care plan for Masdevelia types in a season? How do you grow them? Um, good setup by the, with the lights, by the way. Right, Masdevalias, I'm going to say, are a relatively new genus for me to be doing well. Because in the other place, I always had a couple and they didn't last long. They kept going down. The heat was too much for them. Um, Right, so I haven't got a care plan as such. The reason is that where Mazda Valleys come from in the main are cloud forests and they are places where there's a lot of mist and fog and drizzly rain. This is why their you know, clusters need to stay moist all the time. Um, that's where that comes from, you know. And basically they don't really have seasons in those sort of places. These are evergreen forests for a start, so the season never gets sufficiently beyond the capability of the trees that they decide to dump their leaves. Um, that wouldn't do the Mazda Valley as much good at all, would it? Because they'd then be in bright light, sometimes in full sun, which is not going to do them so much good. So these are evergreen forests that are constantly moist, so that's where the keep them relatively shaded comes from. Um, 
although I don't keep mine that shaded. Mine get a bit more light than perhaps some people do. So there isn't really a care plan seasonally. I let them get almost dry in the winter, if not actually dry, before I water them because I don't want the roots staying soggy when they're not growing as vigorously as they do in the summer growing season. Um, but apart from that, um, the frequency of water change, watering changes purely because my temperature ranges change. So as I get warmer temperatures, I'll water them more often because that period when they're almost dry doesn't take as long. So I'm adjusting the frequency. Also in the winter, I adjust the amount. I don't chuck water all over them in the winter. They get the proverbial trickle around the outside and I watch it run down and make sure the roots I can see have had some moisture, but I'm not drowning the whole pot. Again, lower temperatures. Mazda Valleyers like lower temperatures, but they don't like being soggy with the air moved out of the media because it's full of water. Got to remember, you still need air in there. Right, next one then, Trish Bronk. Would you consider doing a home visit with Lynn? I love her greenhouse and plants. Well, yes and no. Yes, there is one coming up in the not too distant future because I'm hoping to get some divisions of Mazda Valleyers, Draculas and certain types of Dendrobiums from Lynn. But she's got to get her end organised so there's no point in just turning up. So that is on. But you have to bear in mind if you search back through my videos, I've already been to Lynn's and filmed her greenhouses. And I filmed them in a way that she doesn't film them. Because remember, she's got her own channel. I would never want to tread on anybody's channel toes as such. Is there such a thing? Channel toes. Um, but you know what I mean. It's, you know, she's got a channel that goes with her orchids in her greenhouses. And she films them in her way. So I filmed them in a different way. Um, but yes, I have been to Lynn's and had a look around the greenhouses and filmed them. So you'd, you'd have to dig back. Um, you probably, if you search my videos for the word Lynn, you might find them relatively quickly. Uh, right, so this is Fenella, I think that's pronounced um tutu, M tutu. Um, sounds African, um, but she's not in Africa. <laughs> she's in this country somewhere, I believe. This looks very effective with the lights, the Orchid Grotto. <laughs> yeah, I suppose if I put some Christmassy lights around as well, it would look like a little grotto. Um, ah, right. Could you protect warm growing orchids just by protecting their roots? Um, I've never thought of it, but yes, you could. Some people, actually I won't mention it now because I know there's questions higher up on this very subject that I was just about to mention. But yes, you could wrap your pots in sort of bubble wrap um, so you could try protecting the pot with insulation, but go careful shutting too much moisture in and not letting the pot breathe. Yeah, um, but yes, I suppose you could. Um, I haven't and don't. <laughs> Although, as you know, I got rid of an awful lot of my holy clay pots as a consequence of coming here. Clay pots have an evaporative cooling effect. When the pot gets wet, the way that the moisture evaporates out of the clay reduces temperature for the pot and therefore the root mass. Um, so I've got rid of a lot of my clay pots as a consequence. But uh, yeah, I suppose you could warm, um, protect the pots themselves. Right, now we'll have some fun with this one. This is Victoria, spelt with some extra letters and a K. <laughs> um, stump with an F on the end, possibly. Uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce that. This apparently is a silly question. Now I'll remind everybody there are no silly questions, but there might be silly answers. <laughs> you don't ask silly questions. If you can write it down, it's a valid question. Right, how long is Oncidium Twinkle in bloom? I have one. Um, I feel like it took ages for the buds to... Yeah, and don't they just... You get a little thin spike comes out. You think, oh good, it's going to flower. Don't hold your breath. That will take ages and ages for the buds to form and swell and start to show colour, the stages we expect from Oncidium spikes. Ages for the twinkles. 
absolutely ages. Um, so that's not unusual for a start. Um, and when they opened, some of the flowers started to fall off after a week. This doesn't look like normal to me. I think something is wrong. Just to add that the plant is healthy, it has developed nice new root system. The pseudo bulbs are firm, the leaves are nice green. There's more. Uh, no, there isn't actually. <laughs> Looks like it was cut off somehow. Uh, let just have a look. Nope. Oh, I know what it is. It's because I, um, let me just put my coffee down a minute. It's because I expanded um, so the letters were bigger so that I could see what the hell I was doing. And as a consequence, I've chopped some of the question off. Right, that's better. I'll have to squint, won't I? Um, so where are we then? Uh, right. Um, pseudobulbs are firm, leaves are nice green. The orchid has been with me since February. So relatively, that's a new orchid. You know, this is its first winter. Um, this is its first flowering. Yeah and a grow on a windowsill in, in home conditions. Um, right, buds dropping too quickly is often choices, a draft. So if you've got a fan or airflow, get it off the plant while the, while the flowers are there. Sometimes that will knock your buds off as well. So remember what I've said about airflow is the gentlest of movement across the plant. If your plant's waggling around like this and your flower spike's doing this, that's a draft. You're cooling it down by massive airflow. So think about that. That's a possibility. If not, then warm, dry air will do it as well, where the plant can't hydrate up through the spike to the blooms to keep them going. Um, there's not much else, really, that will drop blooms early. I mean, these are not long-lived blooms anyway. The two parents, you know, are, you know, typical oncidiums, um, Sotoanum and I've got the other one. I can't remember which one it is. Chiro Chiroforum, something like that. Anyway, um, all twinkles are produced as primary crosses from those two parents, but the way the different colours are, are, are got are uh, each of those parents have named varieties that are special like bigger blooms, a brighter colour, a duller colour, perhaps heading towards an alba form. Yeah, well you start mixing and matching those and you start producing the different twinkles. Otherwise, if you use exactly the same two parents, in theory, you'd get exactly the same twinkle every time. Um, so that's that. So watch out for drafts. If, you, if, if, if these are healthy bulbs and a good root system, the only other thing it could possibly be is that the plant really was too young to bloom and it can't support the spike. That's a possibility. Or the division was too small if it was a division. Um, but if it's a seedling and that's its first blooming, a seedling will often produce a very weak spike first time round. Right, that's that. Now we've got one of these um, strange IDs that were YouTube generated that get on your throat knees because I'm going to have to just spell it out. It's user followed by T-E-2-K-O-2-J-W-3-D and if I had my channel name like that I would make an effort to change it personally which you can do. You can change your channel name. Um, so uh, what do you think about using heat mats on orchids? That's why I didn't introduce the heat mat subject lower down to that question. That's so why I said I'd wait because I knew this one was coming up. Now, I have never done it. Um, the only time I've ever had heat mats was donkeys years ago in my house where the kids grew up, where I had a greenhouse where I um, planted seeds to go in the garden. And I used heat mats to push those seedlings on in the greenhouse. Um, so I've never used them on orchids. I know some people that do, so it, it, it can work. Um, the only thing I will say is they run on a very low current. They don't use much um, juice, so that's, that's good. That's a bonus in this uh, day and age with the prices. But they don't give off a huge amount of heat. And they tend to work by contact. And if you think about it, all of your orchid pots have got feet. So they're not going to touch the mat. 
You're not going to get a lot of heat into the pots. That could be good because they could dry out incredibly quick. And if you dried out with extra heat, you'd frazzle your roots. So go steady. Um, but I've never used them, so I wouldn't know. But they can work. What might work is what I used to do for my seedlings. And I used to get a tray with the heat mat. In, well, I used a heat cable. And then sand on top of the cable or on top of the mat and keep that damp. Then your pot can go into it, your feet can sink into something and the warmth can be absorbed up into the pot. And the bonus of using damp sand, you get some humidity around the plant because a heat mat on its own will dry the air above it. Yeah. So that's that one. What else have we got? <laughs> I'm going to read this out because I like comments like this when I, when I feel I've actually done some good. <laughs> this is um, Lara Poor. Um, this is more of a thank you than a question. In all my years of growing orchids, I've never managed to flower a nobly typed dendrobium until now. And it's because of your wonderful advice. I've got buds all over mine. When it flowers, I'll post it on Facebook. Thank you, Roger. I like comments like that because it means that, you know, that this stuff that comes out is doing some good at least somewhere, you know, not necessarily every, everywhere, but yeah, uh, that's nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. We've now got Sommer Fuglen. That's Sommer with an O, not with a U. Um, hi, Roger. Glad you're doing another Q&A. Can you talk about high versus low nitrogen feeds? How long have you got? Um, and whether you alternate the regular and bloom booster fertilizers. First of all, you won't ever find me personally using the expression bloom booster, because strictly speaking, there isn't such a thing. But there is average feed where your NPK figures are, well, it's, it's the N and the K. The P doesn't matter if that's lower. In fact, it needs to be really. Um, but a nice average fertilizer is when the N and the K are roughly the same, balanced with calcium and um, magnesium at around half the calcium and about, oh, I don't know, an eighth to a quarter of the magnesium of your N and your K values. So that's an average feed. A high nitrogen feed is where your N value is a lot bigger than your K value. And if that's true, some say the P value needs to come up again as well to go with that higher nitrogen value. And in my view, if you're going to bump that nitrogen right up, I believe you should bump your calcium up as well. Because if you have nitrogen without the backup of something to put the strength into the plant, you get the floppy growth. You know, like when you grow seedlings too far away from your windowsill and they all flop over. It's where they haven't got the strength. Okay, so calcium with higher nitrogen from my point of view. And then you've got, so that's a growing, that's a growing fertilizer. That's for growing stuff, structures. Hang on, let me let Noisy out. Come on, you. You ought to come and say hello first, didn't you? Come and say hello. If you're going to go out, make all that noise. Yes. Say hello to people then. <laughs> you funny cat, you? I don't know why I talk to him, he's deaf as a post. <laughs> Makes me feel good. Come on then. Don't get digging up my new plants. Pest. <laughs> right, where do we get to? Right, so we've done average feeds, N and the K roughly the same. We've now done a high nitrogen feed where the N value rockets up. I always believe that you should back that up with extra calcium. Um, and if you take the calcium up, it pays to take the magnesium up a bit as well. But you can't go too mad with these changes. You get things out of balance and then things start to go wrong. And then what people might call a bloom booster is a low nitrogen feed. And this is a feed that's suitable for a plant where the only thing that's going on is spikes and buds. Yeah, it's still a structure, but it can manage to produce those without the high N. 
whereas anything else, roots, leaves, pseudobulbs, canes, it needs the nitrogen with the calcium. Okay, so I haven't got a low nitrogen feed. I create a high nitrogen feed by adding calcium nitrate to my MSU formula. My MSU formula, the N and the K are roughly the same and the calcium and magnesium are in balance with those values. So by using calcium nitrate, I'm adding nitrogen and calcium. So I bump those two values up without touching the others. That makes it a growing feed for pushing things on. This type of feed probably wouldn't do a paphiopedalum any good at all because you cannot force them to grow fast. They are slower growers than most other orchids. However, when you've got, say, a Dendrobium nobly that's going to grow two foot canes and it's got two or three new growths and you've got to produce those canes in one growing season, that needs feed. That needs a higher nitrogen feed to push. Yeah? And then, the following spring, if you've done your job right with the winter rest, your nobly will start getting nubbins all over it that will eventually push away from the canes and start to form buds. That's quite a good time to use a lower nitrogen feed to hopefully get bigger, better colours on your blooms. Unless, at the same time, your new growth start for the current season, in which case I'd stick to the nitrogen. An average feed will do fine for everything. I don't think orchids are that fussed what they get, quite honestly. They don't get that much in the wild, do they? <laughs> Right, but you won't hear me talk about bloom boosters and grow boosters. A growth booster is a high nitrogen feed, a bloom booster is a low nitrogen feed. The other stuff can stay somewhere near the same in either case. Right, can you explain thrips? Got a flamethrower? <laughs> as I think my dendrobium fowl had them, but I'm unsure as I'm now having a difficult time understanding the difference in what I am finding on the internet. Thanks. This is from Lisa Ford. First thing to understand is thrips is not a single species. There are many types of thrips. Most of them have quite a few elements to their life cycles from an egg through to a flying insect. Some of them have quite a few stages in between. This is the problem with the flipping things. Most of them spend a very short time as a winged insect. That's when you normally see the little blighters. And you think, oh, I'll deal with them. Yeah, well, you deal with them. You've left all the other life stages behind and they're, they're still going on, especially the eggs. Um, it's almost impossible to kill them. Um, so basically, um, you've got to keep at it with thrips. They're not easy to get rid of. One of the more difficult things if you get them in your grow room. Um, systemics, obviously, will do the job. You know the sticky fly strips you get um, are normally yellow. Um, apparently, you can get, I used to have some. There are blue ones which the thrips are more attracted to than the yellow. I've, I've never had them, so I don't know either way. Um, I don't think they're attracted to the pinguiculas that I have for the um, fungus gnats, and they work very well for them. I don't know whether they would work for thrips because I've never had them. I know many people that have had them, and they ended up with having them for quite a long time. They lost their hair, um, used up all their aspirins, and went through practically every chemical on the market. So they're not easy. Um, but basically they are small flying insects when you see them and they have various grub-like stages in their life cycle, most of which live in your media. And some of them live right in the media, not on the surface. So you hardly even know you've got the flipping things. I believe that's where the eggs are laid as well. I've never looked them up to any great extent because I've never had the little blighters. <laughs> if I ever get them... I will turn into the world's leading expert. Let me just let trouble in. You gonna sing us a song? Me? Eh? Here we go. <laughs> He's going in for Eurovision. He'd probably win. In the state of some of the things that get on there. 
Right, <laughs> the stage don't know what the hell I'm on about. Eurovision, it's a, uh, I would call it an amateur song contest, but uh, uh, I think some people think the world of it. Right, the next question is, um, it's a long one. Um, this is Sophie Moe. Dear Roger, I've been gifted a half a dozen orchids, a bulbophyllum, oncidiums, phalaenopsis, polychylos, unless that's a typo, and a slipper. And so, uh, see now, slipper, what is that? A cyp uh, cypridium, is it? Uh, Paphiopedalum? Uh, and the other one, <laughs> the one I don't grow. But there's three basic forms of slipper orchid for a start. They're all totally different. Yeah? So, um, however, my environment is not ready for some of them and the nights can easily be 17 degrees, 17 degrees Celsius or a bit less. 17 degrees Celsius is not cold, so I wouldn't worry about that. Um, a bit less, down to 15 is okay. Depends what sort of plants you've got. Out of those, your bulbophyllum is a big genus and some of those are cooler growers, some are warm to hot. Yeah, well, if it was a warm to hot grower, below 17 is pushing your luck. They should stay above 18 all the time, night and much bigger at daytimes, um, up in the mid to high 20s daytimes. Oncidiums, they vary, but they're fine at intermediate temperatures. They can go down. I mean, at Burnham's, their um, oncidiums are in their um, intermediate. That goes down to 12, 13 degrees at night in the winter. There's a fine. I go down to 15, so I don't push me luck. Um, Phalaenopsis are, generally speaking, warmer growers. They shouldn't really drop below 18. Mine on the kitchen windowsill do occasionally. If we get really cold weather, overnight the house drops down to about 15, 16. Um, but I get up before it gets light. So I'm warming the house back up again before the daylight comes. Um, and slipper orchids vary. Most of them are intermediate, but there are some warmer and some cooler growers. So, um, pro again, this is talking about the pros and cons of a heat mat. Um, well, I've already done the heat mat, so I'm not going to do it again. Um, it is a, a, a way of providing some bottom heat to the pots. They don't really give off enough heat to warm enough of the air to raise the temperature any sensible amount. You're not going to go from 18 degrees to 25 degrees air temperature using a heat mat, I wouldn't have thought. So that's that. Next. <laughs> Insha has raised a really good question. Can't think of a silly question. <laughs> I put an answer on. I'm sure you'll come up with something, but he hasn't, I don't think. Roger, I cannot bloom my cymbidiums. This is from Donna Reed. Any tips, please? Well, I've gone over the two types, yeah? Those that form their embryo spikes in late summer, early autumn, as the night temperatures drop down, and those that form their spikes in late winter, early spring, as a result of the day lengths getting longer and the warmer temperatures. Those are the two different types. Um, those that bloom from now, you know, into late spring, which, which is probably the majority actually, they're generating their spikes in late summer, early spring. They say the best way to do it is get them outside. Otherwise, in your house, that drop in night temperatures is not going to happen. And that may be what inhibits them blooming, because that is a distinct weather-related thing. I mean, all mine go out for the summer, and they don't sit in the sun. They sit in brightest light I've got without the sun hitting them. And this current year, this coming year when they go outside, um, certainly in early spring when I want to get the growths going, I may let them get some morning sun. Morning sun is cooler than evening sun. Yeah? So you can give them that extra kick of light without, you know, warming the plant right up, basically. So that's what mine will get. Um, I have a couple that are the other type that will be forming their spikes late winter. Um, and that, really, that's just a matter of making sure that as the day lengths get longer, 
the temperature goes up a bit. That should do it for those types. Um, right. So that's that. Tips. The next one is oh, that's got big capital letters, Symbidiums. <laughs> it's funny actually. In, in text, certainly on Facebook, capital letters is apparently shouting rather than emphasising. It's shouting. <laughs> So if you put a comment on Facebook in capital letters because you've left your caps lock on and forgotten, apparently you're shouting at people. It's stuff and nonsense. It's text. Um, right, Symbidiums. This is from Clementina Garidou. Oh, that's a long word. That's the trouble with these um, the, the channel names is they're all one word, aren't they? You don't get the breaks where the word breaks are. So the name breaks, if you see what I mean. I have to try and work it out. Right, Symbidiums again then. When in their season do you fertilise and with how much parts per million? How often do you water them? Mine have ridiculous spikes comparing with the size of the leaves and bulbs. Not explained. By ridiculous spikes, do you mean little squatty mini ones? Or giant ones three times the size of the plant? Because I don't, don't know which. I, I can't get it from the wording, so I don't know what your problem is really. Um, but basically Cymbidiums are quite heavy feeders, feeders. As far as parts per million is concerned, this current year mine had um, slow release pellets put on them and the hose was used to water them, so tap water basically, and they got rained on when it rained. And we had some long hot dry spells where temperatures were high and they were getting the hose to water them virtually every day because of the temperature and the drier air. I wouldn't do that normally. And because they're outside, if it rains, then I don't need to water them at all, because they're wet. Um, so how often do I water them? I water them when I think they need some. And with a cymbidium, all mine are in large pots. If I pick the edge of the pot up like that, and I think, uh-oh, I need the other hand, then it doesn't need watering. However, if I pick it up and it flies off the ground and it's light as a feather, it needs watering and it's already too dry. Um, in the growing season, it's best not to let them dry out. Many cymbidiums are terrestrials or semi-terrestrials. Um, some people grow them quite well in a, in a proper terrestrial mix, which is nearly soil, basically. I don't because I like to be able to throw as much water as I want on them and not worry that the roots are rotting. So mine are in the smallest particle in my pots will be bark. Now when I repotted them for the first time, my newer ones, um, a lot of them were in a cocoa fibre peaty type mix as part of their mix and I put some of that to one side and mixed it in with my mix so that the change from one to another wasn't as great. Next time they get repotted, they'll be in bark and bark and perlite in the main is, is what I'm gonna be using. And it will be a mix of um, larger bark at the bottom of the pot to stop it being soggy, to allow that water to drain and make sure there's air there, probably progressing up to medium mixed with small and possibly a higher quantity of small near the top where the roots start and they can get straight into something. So I actually gradate the bark from the top of the pot to the bottom of the pot rather than using the same. That's what I do. And um, yeah, parts per million, I'm, apart from when it's chucking it down with rain when they're probably not going to get fed because it means I have to go outside and I don't do rain. When I am thinking about chucking the hose on my plants next year, I'm actually going to try and stop and think, hang on, you should be feeding your cymbidiums properly, which means I need to mix up some MSU. And from guidance on others, I'd be using my MSU at around six to 700 parts per million to feed my cymbidiums when in active growth. <laughs> I have to add that in every time. If your plant's just been repotted and it's sit there, sitting there in a state of shock and nothing's growing, don't chuck feed on it. Feed them when they're growing. And when they're actively growing, they can be fed quite high. Um, right, where are we now? <sighs> I can't pronounce that. Razak. 
as in R A S double A K. Stinate or Stinati, something like that. Where do you get Fisan in the UK? Yeah, well, you don't. <laughs> if you had Fisan in the UK, you'd be breaking the law for a start. That's just owning it. You certainly can't buy it. I have got some because it's banned in the European, in, European Union, which when I wanted some, the UK was part of. It's not now, we've left. But those sort of rules we've maintained. So we haven't changed those rules just because we're now not in the EU. So Fisan is illegal in this country. It's an offence to own it. Um, it's deemed too dangerous for us grown up people to handle. And when I said on my YouTube channel, you know, I'd have to get some sent over from the States, it's absolutely ridiculous. A couple of weeks later, a parcel arrived unannounced and it was some Fisan 20 from a person I knew really well, another YouTuber, in Spain. And he said, well, you might not be able to get it in the EU, but apparently, <laughs> for some things, Spain has decided it's not in the EU. So he'd managed to buy some in Spain and sent it to me, and it got through customs without getting stopped. <laughs> we were part of the EU then, so there wouldn't, strictly speaking, be any customs. But customs is still there to stop illegal things being you know, transferred from country to country. So, no, you can't have that in this country. Um, does it come under some kind of brand? No. Um, no, you won't find it. Um, I know, oh no, that was Malathian. Somebody got Malathian. That's, that's been seriously banned in this country for donkey's years. Somebody managed to buy that on Amazon here in the UK. It's well out of order. Um, anyway, uh, that's, that's, that's that. Right, Monica Gabe. Hi, Roger. I, I would appreciate your suggestions on how to bloom a Dendrobium Goldschmidtianum. Big long word. <laughs> Starts with Goldschmidt. Um, I've got a reasonable plant, but no blooms yet. Just next to it, I have a much smaller Dendrobium Herco blossom. Well done. And it did bloom. Um, they're totally different. They, they may have similarities in appearance, they're totally different plants for a start. Um, so if your Herco Glossum's blooming, it's probably not light, correct, as you say. Um, now the Goldschmidt-Levanum thingy is a warm to hot grower. And it comes from tropical jungle environments, so this is a lower light requirement. And just think hot steamy, yeah. It needs good temperatures, it doesn't need bright light, and it will always need higher humidity. And although you ought to perhaps reduce watering and feeding during the winter time, it doesn't want any form of proper rest, just in easing off, mainly because it probably won't be growing during that time. Again, we come back to is it growing or not. But that's a warm grower, yeah? So that's gonna need heat, higher humidity, and if possible, keep it growing. Don't give it a rest, just keep it going. And what I might suggest is, if you're Northern Hemisphere, is as we start to come out of winter, reduce that watering down a reasonable amount, not totally, a reasonable amount, and give it a bit more light. And don't go mad, don't start sticking, in, sticking it in a window with bright sunshine. This comes from a jungle environment it won't ever be getting bright light on it it'll always be shaded um, semi-shaded whatever so have a go at that that might help um, right that's that one where's my little arrow gone come on oh last one this is Andrea Allen uh, your plants in your kitchen window do you ever soak them would you just flush them every time you water and how long do you leave it in between? Um, that's going to vary with the seasons. <clears throat> now, although they're in the home, there are still seasons in as much as the house temperature varies depending on what's going on the other side of the glass. In other words, you know, is it winter, is it summer? Now, they are right near the glass without touching it to get the most light possible. These are all Phalaenopsis, <coughs> deemed to be shady growers. Yeah, well, not in the winter in the UK. I keep trying to explain that 
you know, our eyes and brains play silly tricks. You know, it, it seems quite bright at the moment. You know, compared with tropical areas, this is dull, you know. So they're in a nice bright position. They get the temperatures that go with the house. Now, luckily in my house, the temperatures are actually higher in the day when I'm up than when I'm in bed and I'm not up. So my heating shuts down, you know, early evening, something like that. Depends on whether it's a warm day or a cold day. And overnight when it's really cold outside, that kitchen can go down to 15, 16 degrees, which is a bit too low. 18 would be a good minimum at night for those. But it's not every day and it's not for long. Because, you know, it's dark at four o'clock in the evening, so for them it's night time. And the place is still warm, I'm still up. So the house wouldn't start to cool down till sort of much later in the evening, heading towards midnight. And I'm up at silly o'clock and the heating goes on when I get up. So they're not cold for long. So it's not like they're spending, you know, sort of nine, 10, 11 hours at those low temperatures. Um, do I ever soak them? No. Um, the only one I ever soaked was the one from my son in the glass jar because I had no choice. So I used to fill that up with water, leave it for a couple of minutes and then empty it all out. Um, but the others um, are in normal see-through pots in quite large, medium to large bark and or. Um, and I pour lots of water through the pot. I get it very wet when I water them. doesn't matter what time of year, that's how I water those. And then I wait till it's they're virtually dry. The, the roots will tell you on Phalaenopsis. If they're a nice shiny silver looking, then they're, they're dry. They could do with some water soon, if not today. <laughs> if they're still green, they're still wet and they don't want any. Yeah, so they, they tell, they're a nice plant. They tell you when they need water, providing they're in a media that allows that to happen. If you add them in sphagnum moss that stays wet for three weeks, that can't happen, can it? So. Yeah. However, I would never dream of growing Phalaenopsis in sphagnum moss. Why? Because I haven't got the heat. If I could maintain 26 to 29 degrees daytime temperatures for 14 hours, I'd chuck them in sphagnum moss to save water in them so often, and they would grow well. Media depends on your temperatures a lot of the time. How long do I leave it in between until they need watering? And that will vary depending on the ambient temperatures in the house and the length of the days that those temperatures are there for. So, uh, so there we go. I'll just refresh this page to see if anybody snuck any new ones in while we've been chatting. Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. Oh, shut up. There's nothing worse than listening to yourself. Because I refresh the page, it started to play the video. We don't want that. What we do is sort newest first, always bring a new one. No, no, we're okay. So we have done them all. So um, I don't know how long that video is, quite long I suspect, but however long it is, that's how long it is. So I can't see. Oh, it's heading up towards an hour by the looks of it. That's a long one. Um, but it will be your last proper Sunday chat, probably for this year, maybe. Now next weekend, just let you know that Christmas Eve I'll be leaving here in the morning to pick Hannah up and we're going to my son's house and spending the rest of the day, the day there so I'm not here so there won't be a Sunday chat but what I'm hoping to do is film one on Saturday to post Sunday morning so that there is still a Sunday chat on the Sunday but you have to bear in mind it's Christmas Eve who's going to watch it? <laughs> Am I wasting my time here? But I will still record called one. Um, I may even post it Saturday, early on Saturday. So, And then I'll be doing something with Hannah or whatever through the Christmas period. So there will be a break until the Wednesday, the day after Boxing Day. I'm just going to shut down for Christmas and not worry about what's going on. Make sure everything water is watered beforehand so that I've got nothing to do out here, nothing to do on YouTube. So uh, that's the plan. That's the plan. You know me, I could change that plan before I even finish this video. I'm like that. Um, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the questions and answers. Um, 
most of those questions are relatively personal for that individual, but nonetheless, it's a question that others might like the answer to, which is why the questions and answers are done. Otherwise, you could just send me an email and I'll reply to it. That way you ask the question, you get the answer, and nobody else knows it's happened. I think this is a better idea, doing the Q's and A's. So, uh, right, that's that, and um, I'll see you next time. Thanks for dropping by.